Ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jessica is a research biochemist at the Armed Forces Research Institute, uh, AFRI. Um, she uses a rat model of embedded metals, um, such as shrapnel wounds, to examine the health effects of military relevant metals across a multiple, multitude of tissues, collaborating with Maryland VA program and the FDA to identify health risks. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about some work she's done on hydrophobic sand uh, and its use as a novel method for urine collection in the rodent um, that is minimally, minimally invasive. Um, so we thank her for joining today and I'll let her carry it away. Thanks, Eric. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Great. So uh, my goal today is to tell you about this hydrophobic sand as an alternate method for urine collection compared to metabolic cage. I'm going to start with putting it in context of the bigger work that we do, give you the background on what we actually did to compare the two methods, and then put it back into the context of what we're doing now and what we've learned from using it in an actual experiment. So because I work for the government, I have to disclose that the views presented today are my own. I have no conflicts of interest, and the uh, presentation today does not constitute an endorsement of any products by the U.S. government. So our current research is to, sorry, I've got a weird, there we go. Uh, our research goals are to basically um, improve military health and readiness, and we're in a, a big collaboration right now with the Maryland VA system, the FDA, University of Kentucky, to look at a parallel between rat models and humans who've gone through uh, embedded metals either through our surgeries or wounds. So the four major goals are listed here and our overarching goal is to identify potential adverse health risks associated with different types of metal and any biomarker patterns that can be used as an early warning system to improve treatment outcomes for humans. So why are we interested in metals? Basically, in the war zone, a lot more people are surviving shrapnel wounds now, and they come back and there's a lot of smaller pieces in these wounds. And so it's much more likely somebody is going to retain fragments over a long period of time or their whole lifetime, as opposed to having an entire limb amputated when it used to be just a lead ball. Further, there's um, IED or in improvised explosive devices and gunshot wounds and other bombs that could affect civilians as well. So this is not just a military issue. Uh, back in 1991, Operation Desert Storm had a friendly fire incident where our own military was uh, fired upon accidentally and sustained depleted uranium, or here DU, rounds. And DU is a sharp, a self-sharpening metal. So it's a really good effective munition. And so it leaves a ton of tiny fragments in the body. But DU is also minimally radioactive, and people were concerned about how this would affect the health of the person because up until this point, most metals were considered innocuous. So AFRI was tasked with creating the first model for a shrapnel wound study, and we're going to continue using that model here. But uh, a series of tests basically showed that the biokinetic, toxicological, and carcinogenic effects of a lot of metals that could be involved in a military setting are, are not known. And so that's why we, we chose to work forward with this. So this is just to visualize the shrapnel wounds uh, in the body as a wound. And so this is the self-sharpening D round. You can see all these fragments coming off of it. Um, this is from a Boston Marathon bomb injury. This is an IED in a hip. You can see all these fragment pieces, a gunshot injury, and in this photo, this x-ray, you can see that these two pieces circled in red look like they would actually be shrapnel pieces, but they're um, surgical pins. And so just going off of an x-ray, it's really hard to identify what would need to be removed in the first place. So they're very complicated wounds. The red embedded model looks basically like this. Um, these are not this study. This is a previous study. And small metal pellets, which start out as cylinders, are surgically implanted into the, the leg muscles of the rat. And this just shows you where they look, or, or where they're located and how they look compared to what we're trying to model in the human. So we're circling back to the overall goal, and we're interested in comparing what happens in the rat once they've been exposed to metal over time to what happens in the humans after they've suffered this type of wound. 
and people are typically not willing to give brain and liver samples for biopsy periodically. So the easiest way to do that is to collect blood and urine because it's repeatable and minimally or non-invasive. And then that brings us to the main point of my talk today, which is urine collection in rats. So typically, um, rodents aren't willing to pee in a cup on demand like a human would. So one of the more common ways to collect urine from a rat or a mouse is a metabolic cage. So the rat is placed in this little cylinder here on a wire mesh floor, and it can be up to 24 hours, depending on the study. And the urine and the feces both pass through that, that grate and collect down along this filter into two separate tubes. So one collects the feces and one collects the urine. This is very stressful for the animal. Uh, this is completely different from home cage and uncomfortable and you have to go through a habituation period in order to actually get the animals comfortable enough to actually use um, this without having high corticosteroid levels uh, in your urine. So my favorite part of this talk is that the way we found hydrophobic sand is that my PI actually was checking his junk mail and saw an ad for something called lab sand or kit for cat is the uh, public version of it. It's basically developed in order to allow people at home to collect samples for their cats so they can do um, veterinary analysis more easily. And so we looked into it for rodents and there wasn't a whole lot of publication. So we thought, why not test it against the metabolic cage? Uh, we had some animals that were going to be going through practice surgery procedures for us before we started the big project. And so this would be a great time to test that with animals we already had. So hydrophobic sand is basically a sand that is coated with a proprietary material that allows the urine or any, any liquid to basically form a, a bubble on top of the sand when it's exposed. And so all we do is we put the hydrophobic sand in the bottom of an, a micro isolator crate with a lid because they will hop out and you can collect the urine uh, from the sand directly with a pipette. So the criteria to be a suitable replacement for a metabolic cage is to actually have um, the material be non-toxic. And so it, it's in the MSDS for this material. It's been through toxicity testing, but we decided to look at that anyway. Animals can experience no more stress than experienced with metabolic cages. Um, less would be a bonus, but all we're looking for is no different. <clears throat> you have to be able to collect a similar amount of volume, otherwise it's not useful. And the urine samples have to be uncontaminated by the lab sand, again, otherwise it's use useless. So for this, we did a within subjects crossover design. We had eight animals total, so four started in group A, which was with metabolic cage, or for the other four started in group B, which was the lab sand to start. Metabolic cages need a habituation period. So what we did was the first day would be two hours in either group, and then a 24 hour rest period, and then a four hour session in your respective group, rest period day, uh, six hours, rest period, six hours, rest period, six hours. And then at the end of this session, we would switch and then anybody who's in a metabolic cage to begin with was now going to be in lab sand, and anybody who was in lab sand is now going to be in the cage. This way, everybody experiences both, and you don't have an order effects of what they were exposed to first. Uh, one thing to note is that the metabolic cage, because of the way it collects at the bottom of this cone here, you can't actually track the volume over time. So we only were able to do a total volume at the end. With the lab sand, we were collecting it every half hour so that the animals weren't running through it. And we were able to track volume as we went through each of these sessions. All of this is published, so you can take your time going through the details that I'm gonna to have to glaze over here, but um, feel free to look these up and then email me if you have any questions. So for the toxicity, we were concerned that the animals could be breathing it in because the sand is very fine. And we went through different fractionation tests and looked at the sizes and distribution. And uh, one of the things we needed to make sure was that there, they weren't breathing in the sand. So we had uh, a never exposed group, which was basically rats from somebody else's lab who we got had never seen lab sand ever before. And we took lung tissue from them. Our past exposure group was animals that had been through the entire procedure but had not seen lab sand since the end of the procedure. 
I know several weeks since the last session because again, these were used for our surgical training for the, the big project. But we also needed to make sure that they weren't immediately breathing it in. So for an acute exposure, we chose a few of the rats and put them back into lab sand for two hours prior to euthanasia and looked at the lung tissue then. So this is the H&E staining. We saw no evidence of damage to any tissue. Uh, this is a polarized light image of the same tissue. And if they had inhaled particulate, it would have shown up uh, very brightly on the, the image. There was no evidence of particulate having been caught in the lungs. Um, we also looked at the stomach contents and have looked at the stomach contents of all of the animals that have gone through lab sand in our big project since, and we have not seen any evidence of lung damage or um, the ingestion into the gut. Uh, for one more toxicity test, we took a common method for in vitro cytotoxicity, and we did a cell culture exposed to various um, dilutions of a cell media exposed to lab sand that had been tumbling for a period of time, and then put that media onto the cells. If the lab sand had leached off something toxic to the cells, we would expect a decrease in viability, but they were all at the same viability level as controls. So we didn't see any evidence of, of direct chemical toxicity from the sand. For stress, we looked at several different measures and uh, session weight differences. Um, rapid weight loss is one way of measuring stress. And so they were weighed at the beginning of each session at the end of each session. And again, this is within subjects. So the connecting lines are for an individual animal in uh, his, they're all males by the way, his metabolic cage in black, and then the same animal's lab sand results in the white. So we saw no uh, statistical differences in any group session for uh, immediate weight change. And then the fecal pellet totals is another method of analyzing stress, typically rodents will drop more fecal pellets if they're more stressed out. We only saw a significant difference, which was a slightly higher number in the lab sand group in the two hour session, but I think it's really due to this guy here. Uh, everybody else was statistically non-significantly different. For corticosterone in the urine, which is another method of looking at stress levels in rodents, um, we see that over time, corticosterone is definitely decreasing, which shows you that habituation is working, that over re uh, repeated exposure to either method, the stress is decreasing. But we saw no significant differences between any of the groups, um, metabolic cage versus lab sand. Now, we didn't quantify behavior, but we did do some observation and took photos. And um, this is the hydrogel cup that they were put in with because we didn't want water from the water bottles to be diluting any of the urine. And so we gave them hydrogel cups, which we heard about a little bit earlier today. And the animals thought they were play toys. And so they typically got turned around and, and jumped in and I'll come back to that later. But the, in general, the metabolic cage animals were more observed being a bit more hunched and up on their toes, trying to avoid the, the grate. Or they would get into these little bald positions to try and protect their feet. And the lab sand animals seemed like they were just in their home cage and half the time they'd curl up in the corner and sleep. So for the urine volume collected, um, again, we couldn't do anything other than a total volume at the end for the metabolic cage, but we were able to do uh, urine volume over time every half hour with the lab sand. So looking at total urine, which was pooled in the lab sand sessions for each individual animal, uh, we saw some differences in some groups sometimes. So in general, if there was a significant difference, the metabolic cage animals had more urine collected than their counterparts in the lab sand. Uh, turns out this was because the animals in the metabolic cages can't access their urine, whereas the ones in the, the lab sand are able to look at it and play with it and drink it. So we hadn't anticipated that, but we dealt with that uh, later. So if you look at the amount left over time, you can actually see that most, and by most I mean more than 50%, more than 60% of the volume that we collected happened within the first two hours, no matter what session it was. So we were able to get about a mil and a half within the first two hours of either method. And for our uses, that was plenty. So this would indicate that we could actually do a shorter session and be just as effective. 
Uh, we looked at a whole bunch of different common urine markers. Um, there's a list here. Again, it's all in the paper. You can, you're welcome to look at this, the details specifically, but we saw no differences in clinical markers that would be relevant to anybody looking at um, health responses. And so the lab stand is not affecting these markers in the urine. We also looked at metal concentration in the urine because we're interested in, again, implanted metals. And with the humans, we know that a lot of times metal that's involved in a shrapnel wound will actually be released and spread throughout the body and come out in the kidney and, and the urine. So we need to make sure that the lab sand does not artificially affect our metal concentrations that we're reading. And so these animals at the time of the lab sand and metabolic cage had no surgeries, no implanted metals at all, they're naive. So uh, these are just metals that come up naturally in a rodent's urine from its diet or whatever. And the only ones that were significant was aluminum, which ended up being higher in the lab sand group in several sessions, and copper, which was actually higher in the metabolic cage session in several sessions. And I need to point out that yesterday, the, uh, the idea of controls came up several times. And so it's really important here that you note that we also took a, a urine sample from the bladder at euthanasia and then compared it back to all of these values. So with the aluminum, you can see that the lab sand urine collections had higher concentrations than both the urine from the metabolic cage as well as the bladder urine, which tells me that the lab sand is probably somehow adding aluminum to the urine. With the copper, however, uh, the metabolic cage was higher than the bladder, and since the bladder has not had any access to either method, this would lead you to believe that the metabolic cage, which is plastic, is somehow adding copper to the urine. If we didn't have this bladder control, we would actually think that the lab sand was somehow absorbing or taking copper out of the urine. So long story short, we were investigating the source of the aluminum as well as why copper was higher in the metabolic cage. And we did a series of spiked tests with, um, with uh, synthetic urines. We did some digestions of the lab sand in, in different levels of acids. Um, we had a, a gastric acid substitute as if they had eaten the sand versus a uh, nitric acid, which basically destroys everything. And we found that there was some aluminum in the lab sand itself, but not to the point where anything was going to come off of the lab sand in just a urine type of liquid. We actually had to destroy the lab sand to have the, the aluminum come out. Copper was not found in the lab sand at all. And so through a series of tests of different water sources in our labs, we found that copper is actually really high in the sink that we were using to wash the metabolic cages. And so we think that washing the cages and letting them dry allowed copper deposits to lay along, <clears throat> along the, the funnel and then were picked up by the urine and, and thus adding copper to the urine. Um, it just had nothing to do with lab sand. The aluminum ended up being actually more from the hydrogel cups. So the, the cups had a foil cover, much like a, a, a yogurt cover or applesauce, and when we tested the aluminum content of the gels themselves, there was a lot of variability, but some of them had very high aluminum content. And so since the animals were playing with the cups and we only needed a shorter session, and the aluminum was a potential source of uh, problem with the, the urine samples, we decided to just not use the hydrogel cups in the future. So one of the other things that is really important for what we're doing is looking at potential biomarkers in the urine. And so one of the things that you can do is look at extracellular vesicles, which are basically very tiny packets of um, some protein and small RNAs, microRNAs, um, signals that come from different cells in the body, such as the kidney will slough these off. And then they come out in the urine, you can collect them and then profile the microRNAs. So we're looking at a microRNA profile in our rat urine and hoping to do the same thing in the human project in parallel with ours. So again, we need to make sure that the lab sand didn't affect the quantity or, or quality of the microRNAs that we could collect. And so when we look at the particle size distribution collected off of um, 
urine from both collection methods, there was no difference uh, in the range of particles that were coming off. There was a, a slightly higher concentration in particle in, of particles in the lab saying collected urines, um, not to statistical significance. Uh, so it doesn't really mean anything other than we're not losing the ability to collect particles and extracellular vesicles. The microRNA abundance qualified and validated by qPCR was also not significantly different between the two different collection methods. And the total RNA that we were able to collect from each sample was also not different by collection method. So this means that we can actually go back to our replacement criteria and we discovered that it seems to be non-toxic to animals. They don't appear to be any more stressed during lab sand than metabolic cage. And if anything, they might be less stressed. We are able to collect a comparable amount of volume, at least for what we needed. And so far, the urine samples appear uncontaminated by lab sand. So um, we decided to move forward with the lab sand as opposed to metabolic cage. Um, one of the other uh, features that's nice about this is that metabolic cages are a huge pain and they're hard to clean and they're very expensive. So if you can use the lab sand instead, while it can't be your first feature for actually choosing an, an alternate method, since it's a comparable method, the fact that it's also easier to use is a bonus. So um, back to our, our main goal is to look at metal solubilization throughout the body from different implanted metals. Um, and then identify short and long-term health effects, track those changes in biomarkers, and hopefully correlate them to changes in human. So the experimental design that we have is male sprog dolly rats, um, 41 to 30, 43 days old, um, within a, a weight range. We do pre-urine collections, uh, or pre-surgery urine collections, uh, two weeks after they've arrived. They're chipped and implanted, and then we follow their, their weights and health throughout the period of the experiment. Um, we collect urine one week prior to euthanasia and animals are euthanized at one, three, six, or 12 months post implant. There are eight animals per metal per time period. So we have um, all of these different metals that are being in, implanted into the rats. Um, so one animal will get four pallets of tantalum total, two per leg into the gastroc just like I showed you in the x-rays, um, or tungsten, or nickel, or cobalt, etc. So uh, visually, this looks like this. So we have our one-month implant group, our three-month implant group, uh, six-month and 12-month, and then we have the pre-surgery ur urine collection, pre-euthanasia urine collection. And then because we have lab sand and we're able to actually do this over a period of time, we're able to do within subject collections for the urine collections in the 12 month group, which actually allows us to be part of that three R's where we're refining how much we can collect from single animals with uh, very minimal additional efforts uh, or stresses to the animal themselves. So I'll just quickly show you a couple of things from our work and none of this is published, so please treat accordingly. So with all of the animals, 288 animals, the urine session collections had quite a range. Some animals refused to go at all. Some were massive producers and we could get over six mils out of them in a single session. Uh, everybody was in a two hour session. We found that if we had no production or no production, we could actually give them a second day of production just to increase the volume that we could get. And on average, we were able to get about a mil and a half, which is what we were seeing in the original pilot. And then you have the, the stats here. Interestingly, the pre-surgery volumes were the highest uh, for all the groups, and then they tended to not pee as much as they got older. We didn't really look into that, I just think it's interesting. Um, for the metal concentrations, these are the um, individual one, three, six, or 12 month time periods for nickel or depleted uranium. And we can see that in the urine, we're seeing an elevated level of both metal types compared to the tantalum and planted controls. Now this compares to previous human work where um, humans that did not have an embedded fragment had very low levels of uranium coming up in their urine over time. Whereas people with known 
depleted uranium fragments actually had uh, elevated levels of uranium in their urine over many years. So this is the type of connection that we're trying to make. Um, very briefly, we're also looking at several urine markers and um, these are two different markers. So TIM1 and ALP in the urine and two different metals. So the black is the tantalum control. It's the same in both groups for the same marker. Um, blue is the nickel, red is the DU implanted animals. And you can see already that we're starting to see different patterns of biomarker based on the metal. So once we have a big panel of all of these, we can move that forward to what we see in the humans and hopefully connect it to health effects that we're seeing downstream of the metal, uh, specific metals, and we can use it as a, a precursor for treating humans that have similar metal trotinol Um So we're doing a whole lot more assays and we're working with the VA to track this in humans as well as our animals that have all been treated and we're going through the data right now. Hopefully we can put together a database um, to flag early treatment for people. Uh, some final conclusions on the lab sand, what we learned. Um, the boxes are sold with 300 gram bags and that turned out to be the perfect amount of sand for the bottom of a micro isolator cage. You basically want to make sure that the edges of the sand are high enough that the urine doesn't just fly down the side if they pee too close to the edge of the crate. Um, and that worked really well. One to two hour sessions were great. Rats tended to fall asleep if they were in there longer and that's just wasting everybody's time. Uh, you want to stay with the rats and collect the urine as it's excreted rather than every half hour like we saw. Then they don't have a chance to drink it and you get more urine out. Um, short turns mean that food and water supplements are not needed and therefore it's um, even less stressful for the animals. And you can use the same sand per rat if you need to repeat a day, but you use uh, fresh sand for individual animals. So if you don't get enough urine the first time, save the box to the side, use the same box the next day for the same rat, and then you can dump it in regular waste. So um, I hope this is helpful to anybody looking to do urine collection from rodents, and it has certainly helped us. So I wanna very quickly thank all of our lab members and collaborators our funding because otherwise we couldn't do anything and the organizers here today thank you very much for including me in the talk thank you jessica and thank you to all three of our panelists